Thank you very much. Um, Donna. Another old school here. Do you want to sit in my seat? Oh, sure. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll feel like I'm on a bus. <laughs> oh, and just so that folks know, this is Orca, which is a local um, public access, and so you will all be, except for me, I figure out how to sit so that I'm not. <laughs> um, we will all be on. And you are on tape. Great. Hello. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Donna Bailey, and I'm the director of the Addison County Parent-Child Center. Uh, we at the Addison County Parent-Child Center and within the Parent-Child Center network work with young families to help them get off to the right start and to connect them with a myriad of services, starting with prevention. In Addison, we work on primary preven pregnancy prevention with individuals and in groups through our local high schools and community programs and in homes. We use research-based curriculum and trained staff and RN and other home visitors, such as social workers and um, others, to help young women and men get the information they need and to get, their, to get to their medical provider in order to stay healthy. The prevention of STDs and STIs and pregnancy, as well as promoting healthy relationships, is at the core of our work in prevention. The work of parent-child centers are most known for intervention work with young families in need. We work with teen parents and young parents to help them complete school and move into adulthood with the skills and support necessary to be successful. Thank you. We work with excuse me, families living in poverty, families with substance issues, and families living in a cycle of violence and neglect. We advocate for and help young, fam young parents build a network of support in order again to build a healthy family. Many of, our fam many of our families that we work with intensively have DCF involvement or fear of the arrival of DCF family services in their lives. All parent-child centers have a holistic approach to working with, young, with youth and young families, and, it allows us, and that allows us to meet people where they are and have a relationship in which support without judgment can occur. We can help people find a medical home and treatment housing, a dentist, get a high school diploma, child care, transportation, and financial support. At, at, at Addison County Parent-Child Center, we provide an alternative high school program in which parents and prevention students, those without a child, are together and are influencing each other in positive ways, which include preventing either first or second pregnancies. The work of prevention is critical, and yet is the least funded. All parent-child centers do prevention work every day. Before I talk about um, some of, um, before I go on in my testimony, I'd like to read a letter that was written by one of our participants in my program. It's unedited. I'm gonna, she wasn't able to come today due to the timing of transportation, but I did wanna read it um, into the record. I have also, I think it's also on your iPads as I sent it in earlier. When I was 14, I had an abortion. I did it without my parents because I was scared of what they would think. I was doing drugs and drinking every day. I knew I was not anywhere close to ready to raise a baby. I couldn't even take care of myself. People always say there's another option, but not another option for me. I could have carried the baby and gave it up for adoption, but that still nine, meant nine months growing in me, nine months of an unhealthy pregnancy, and most likely a very unhealthy child. I didn't want to. I really didn't. But something in me told me this was my only option. I knew I didn't want to stop partying. I knew I didn't want to stop the drugs. I knew I couldn't happily grow a baby. I think about this all the time, especially being a mother now. I'm 18 years old with a very handsome 17-month-old boy named Reese. I think about what will happen if the right for women to get abortions is taken away. I worry for all the unwanted children brought into this world because of not having a choice. Just because you have a child does not make you a mother. And when you take the choice away, it's the children that are blamed and grow up feeling unloved. It makes an impact for their whole life. Growing up thinking it's okay to take out your anger, stress, hatred, and unhappiness on your child is not okay and never will be. No one working a minimum wage job can support themselves and a child. State's assistance helps families who can, can't afford to care for their children. People also complain about paying for other people's children. 
kids, sorry. But you are trying to take away the choice about having someone, someone having kids, even if they know they can't afford to do it on their own. Living an unhappy life and raising an unhappy child is not okay. Taking the choice away from a woman to reproduce is not okay. A participant of the Addison County Parent Child Center, Bryden Alger. Having the option to safe and legal abortion is an important piece of women's health. We cannot erode the work we have done on promoting health care and self-care of a woman in the area of reproduction. While abortion rates are low and dropping, we need to ensure that women are able to make the best choice possible for themselves and that they know when they are ready to have a baby. Vermont's highest abortion rates are for mothers in their 20s, as, in, in, as is the case across the United States. On the other hand, abortions amongst adolescents aged 15 to 19 are relatively low, both in Vermont, 10.2%, and nationwide, 9.8%. Yeah, all right. <laughs> there are hyperlinks too to more data as you're listening in, in your um, report. You don't need to do it now, but there's so this is from the uh, uh, new report from the CDC. And prevention says that there were uh, 1,265 abortions performed in Vermont in 2015, the latest year for which uh, agency com the agency compiled such data. The CDC reports report says that between 2016 and 2015, the adolescent abortion rate decreased by 54% nationally. The decrease in abortion rates was greater than the de decrease for women in any older age group. I want to give a shout out to the parent child centers here as we do a lot of prevention work on that issue and to um, birth control options that are, um, that are more effective than ever before. Um, so that gave Vermont a rate of 10.9 abortions per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 44, down from 13 in 2006. Federal documents also show the number of abortions in Vermont fell 21% in a decade from 2006 to 2015, and nationally dropped 24%. There were 1,781 abortions performed in Vermont in 2000, and 3,184 in, in 1990, a year in which there were one point for three million abortions nationwide. Vermont matches up fairly well with the national data on weeks of gestation at the time when abortion is performed. Federal statistics say that nearly 72% of Vermont abortions happen at eight weeks or earlier, and another 24 happen between nine and 13 weeks. Nationally, there's been a shift towards earlier abortions, and the CDC says the number of abortions performed at more than 13 weeks has remained consistently low. Some of that data came from Vermont Digger. Um, the effort to lower teen pregnancies um, are working in this state, and in fact, throughout the nation. Pre pregnancy prevention has been aided by the promotion and use of LARCs, long-acting, reversible contraceptives. Thank you to this committee and the State House for your work on that issue. It's making a real difference. The option of abortion for unwanted pregnancies is critical for the life trajectory of a young woman and for the importance of having a wanted child. As women, we carry our future. It is essential that we be, be empowered to move forward with the freedom of choice. A large por proportion of induced abortions worldwide are due to unwanted or mistimed pregnancies. Unintended pregnancies result in about 42 million induced abortions per year worldwide. In the US, over 92% of abortions are the result of unintended pregnancies. Excuse me, there's a gap in the... It, it's costly to have babies, okay? <laughs> Nationally, these are national st statistics, but I think it's important um, here, too, to see that 51% um, of all U.S. births in 2010 were paid for by public insurance through Medicaid. So this is a cost to our society, um, to our funds as uh, in government, and yet it is critically important for health. So. Um, Public insurance program paid 68% of the 1.5 unplanned births. Um, and, sorry, I'm breathing through here. In the absence of, um, the, excuse me, the, un, the public cost of unintended pregnancies in 2010 may have been 75% higher had we not been doing the work we are doing. The gross Total gross potential savings from averting all unintended pregnancies in 2010 would have been $15.5 billion. This is 
less than the total public cost of all unintended pregnancies because even if all women had not been able to time their pregnancies as they wanted, some of the resulting births still would have not been publicly funded. These potential savings do not account for the public investment in family planning services and the other interventions that may be required to achieve that. <coughs> Any woman not being not able to access a safe abortion would find herself in an un living, unhealthy living situation. Either her own health may be at risk or the fetus, and then the born child could be at risk. We know that abuse and neglect rates have risen in Vermont due to substances and poverty. The lack of housing, food, adequate health care, transportation, etc., are stressors in families that can lead to abuse and neglect. It is important that children in these situations are all wanted children. This makes them safer. <clears throat> the following data, I'm not going to read all of this. Um, again, you have it. You have it in your iPads. Um, but I think what's critically important here is to make sure that children are wanted ch children when we're looking at an increase of abuse and neglect with the children that exist. Um, and so uh, just to highlight a couple of points, in 2015, there were 900 21 victims of abuse or neglect in Vermont um, at a rate of 7.7 .7 .7 per thousand in children, an increase of 13.3 percent from 2014. Um, 47.9 were physically abused, 51.5 were sexually abused. Again, uh, the number of children living apart from their families in out of home care has increased 31.9 percent in comparison to the number of children in out-of-home care in 2011. I think the other thing to highlight, and I understand this committee worked on thinking about reach up this morning, uh, the other piece of this puzzle is the cost of TANF um, in, um, and what that can you know, cost us in our society. Um, and I think it's important to look at the data around child poverty and income support. The insecurity of income, having enough income, housing, food, transportation, and the lack of quality childcare in this state all make it, uh, all make the decision of having a child an important decision for the individual parents involved. Um, and again, it adds to the stress of being a parent. And those of us who are parents know that it's not easy in the best of um, the best of times. So I think uh, again, all these issues of lack of affordable childcare, housing, mm -hmm. and fairly paid jobs are a stress. Legal and safe abortion is a critical option to protect public health. It is critical to the health and well-being of families, and to lessen the strain on social services. I am proud to live in Vermont and to work to help promote a healthy place for children and families to grow. A woman's self-determination and reproductive health is at the root of this. Thank you for legally supporting a woman's right to choose and being part of a healthy Vermont. Thank you, Donna. Uh, questions? Can you tell me what uh, in federal legislation or any Vermont law that takes away <coughs> a woman's right to choose? Uh, no, I know that it's protected to keep a woman's right to choose. It's our law, the federal law. So your answer is you know of nothing in federal or state law that takes away a woman's right to choose? I, I understand that according to our Constitution and the decision from the Supreme Court um, is that it is, a, it is a woman's right to choose. Can you tell me what the necessity of this legislation that we're talking about today is? I, I think the importance is uh, to protect women and children, and especially um, to make sure that the children we have are planned and that women's health and that women are able to make uh, decisions for themselves and protected and funded in that. Is there anything that in law today in Vermont that, that says that's not possible? <clears throat> what you just said? That, that's probably a bigger question than I can answer because of legal decisions. And, and Topper, okay. Bryn will be um, speaking to us as the um, Legislative Council around Vermont law. 
uh, when we finish with today's witnesses. Are there other questions for John? Yes. I just had a question uh, about why is there a, such a, a large uh, emphasis on not allowing parents the right to uh, give permission for an abortion for an underage child? Okay. Uh, I've heard different explanations, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's a concern to many of us that sure. parents do not have the right to make a, a, such an important decision mm -hmm. or to be part of that important decision. Or grandparents, as the case may be. Yeah, right. or, or, okay. uh, I, or you know, court system? Hmm? Or a court system? Or no, you're not? I, I'm wondering about parents, Just in parents. particular, grandparents, mm -hmm. if they're the guardian or whatever. Okay. So according to the law, an, a, a woman 12 years or older has the right to her own decisions around reproduction, not including parental what, what consent, correct? That, that, no. So I, I can't. I, I don't. I can't well, say. Well, Brent probably can answer that. Yeah. And the age thing. I, I don't so. want to speak okay. incorrectly, right. but that's the that's the practice and the law in, in Vermont. And uh, you know, while I think it's uh, it takes many people aback to think of a 12 year old making those kinds of critical decisions, um, I think it's also critically important to think about um, young girls in this situation who might be pregnant um, again, not by choice, um, but through either actions of abuse, which in fact legally it is sexual abuse because they're under the age of consent. Um, so that may be from someone in their family, which may make it unsafe for a child to, a young woman to tell their parents and include their parents in a decision. Um, it may also be through assault. Um, and it, you know, for other reasons, I think it's a safety issue to me more, more than anything. So following <clears throat> Representative Rosenquist's question, uh, what is your views on uh, court-appointed um, um, guardians uh, or uh, counselors, whatever you want to call them, for that decision? You can't go to a parent. That's, that's, that's true. There's the cases you can't. Uh, but what about involving other adults through the court system, um, which a lot of states already provide for? Well, I think that would add to, um, I mean, there's other issues within that, uh, I think, because, you know, a, a, a young a, young woman or girl may be making decisions that, that's not part of a legal system. They're in. Uh, they're making a decision with a medical provider. Well, the reason I, well, the reason I ask, I mean, under 18, you're not able to enter a contract and make decisions. So, um, I just normally there's there's some provision for adults to be involved in some way. So I'm just curious what your opinion was. So that's all I wanted to know. Yeah, I, my opinion is that um, that's something that the medical provider should work with the person on. Sure. Thank you. I think other questions for Donna. Donna, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I leave. Yes. Who should I give a copy to? Um, okay. I'll, I'll sure. probably send a revised <laughs> one, but for now, hey, give me that clean. So, um, I leave. Wow. Which is fine. You don't. I'm going to do more now. Sorry. The, um, those of you are, are technical people at the end of the table. We don't have something to. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, um, I had 24 hours and I barely got it done. Yeah, I, 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 it's not a problem. I yeah. want us all to be looking at something for which we didn't need to be looking for. Okay. Um, sorry for this question. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to come before you and testify in opposition to H57, an act relating to the preserving the right to abortion. Um, I oppose the legislation, the legalization of abortion in general, um, but I am sharing my perspective as a mother of a child with Down syndrome. I'm the mother of two daughters. Um, the younger one named Sadie is the one with Down syndrome, and she's now 20. And she's a special young lady and the joy of our lives. And here's her, her picture <laughs> from high school. Just keep this here to uh, keep me calm. <laughs> um, I know that. Those of you on the board, uh, on the committee here um, care about you know social justice and um, care about vulnerable individuals such as those with disabilities and I'm sure that's why you serve not only in the legislature but in other um, organizations um, you know and, and to improve the lives of Vermonters. So I want to share with you today the devastating effect that legalized abortion, the very procedure that the House is aiming to preserve by this proposed legislation, 
is having on the population of um, Down syndrome. Um, I, I'm sorry, I did a little cut here and I forgot to um, add a little information, but Dr. Scacco, um, he's from Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, conducted a study with um, some others that estimated um, at about one third of the population of individuals with Down syndrome in the US has been lost to abortion. In that study, they referred to an earlier study that estimates that the rate of abortion of babies with Down syndrome is about 67% um, in the United States for those um, who are diagnosed prenatally. The, the rate varies among geographic areas and demographic groups. Geographically, the Northeast and Hawaii are, have the highest rates, and I would expect that Vermont would be included in that higher rate. I don't know that for sure, but I, uh, that, that's my suspicion. Um, and I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, in Europe, the rates are even higher. In France, the abortion rate for babies prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome is 77%. In the UK, 90%. Denmark, 98%. In Iceland, an unbelievable 100% of babies who are diagnosed with prenat prenatally with Down syndrome are aborted. Now, there may be a few here and there that are born um, because maybe the test was inaccurate or maybe the mother chose not to undergo testing. But in those two countries that are high, um, Denmark and Iceland, um, a high, about well, 80 to 85 percent of women in um, Iceland and 90 percent in Denmark do get tested. So they um, they essentially are catching most most of the babies um, that are conceived with Down syndrome in these countries, and um, there there are not many who escape the net. In 2017, CBS News on assignment produced a show that investigated the eradication of babies with Down syndrome in Iceland. This is an issue that has grabbed international attention. It's not just um, pro-lifers or, or you know, parents of children with Down syndrome. This has captured um, attention all around the world. When abortion is allowed for any reason with no restrictions, it's also allowed for discriminatory reasons, such as having, a, such as um, eradicating the babies you know, with Down syndrome. Of course, in order to abort based on disability, the disability must be detected. This is why prenatal testing was developed. And if I'm not mistaken, the primary reason for the development of amniocentesis was primarily to detect Down syndrome specifically. Prenatal testing is routinely performed on pregnant mothers to detect whether their babies have Down syndrome as well as other genetic con conditions. Uh, but in general, the focus is Down syndrome. Without going into too much detail, I would just say that advances in non-invasive prenatal tests, or NIPs, along with the current policy recommended by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, that all pregnant mothers be offered prenatal testing. Um, previously, it was only offered to older mothers where the risk was higher. Um, uh, has led to many more babies with Down syndrome being detected in the womb than ever before. Statistics tell us that when they are detected, almost three quarters of them will be aborted, at least in the United States. All of this new non-invasive testing alone, um, I haven't mentioned it too much, but there is this, um, since 2011, new tests have been introduced that are accurate and um, can be done early in pregnancy and uh, are non-invasive, they're just a maternal uh, blood test. Um, is completely harmless to babies with Down syndrome. Testing merely gives us information. It is le le the legality of abortion that is threatening their lives and drastically reducing the Down syndrome population around the world. This routine practice of screening for babies with Down syndrome so they can be aborted is nothing short of discrimination. For a state that prides itself on respect, <coughs> tolerance, and equality, it is unconscionable that we allow this. The situation is so alarming that there is a trend for other states, uh, North Dakota, Ohio, Indiana, and Louisiana so far, to enact bans on aborting babies specifically for the reason of having Down syndrome or other disabilities or for the sex of the baby if it's, an, um, if it's not the right desired sex. Other states such as Pennsylvania and Utah can, have considered bills, though those bills were ultimately not passed into law. All but the North Dakota law have been challenged in court. Indiana's law prohibits a baby from being aborted solely based on, quote, race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex, or diagnosis, or potential diagnosis of the fetus having Down syndrome or any other disability. It was challenged by Planned Parenthood and was subsequently blocked by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. 
Indiana's Attorney General has petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to review the state's 2016 law. This review has uh, been relisted to this coming Friday, as I understand it. This law, has that, this law that seeks to ban the discrimination practice of aborting babies based on the disability or the wrong sex might very well go to the U.S. Supreme Court. So while other states are trending toward protecting unborn babies with disabilities and babies of undesired sex, this state seems to be moving backwards by preserving in law no restrictions whatsoever. In the, in the late 1950s, a renowned French researcher and physician, Dr. Jerome Lejeune, discovered that an extra 21st chromosome is what caused Down syndrome. He was horrified when the medical field used his discovery to detect unborn babies with Down syndrome so that they could be aborted. Um, his goal was to find the cause so that he could find the cure. He saw how badly mistreated they were in France, and um, they were his patients. And um, he just, he dedicated his whole life to trying to find a cause so that he could find, excuse me, find a cure. Just a few decades ago, when parents were told their newborns had Down syndrome, they were advised to put them in, an in, to put them in institutions to forget they were born. I'm old enough to remember Geraldo Rivera's investigative expose on ABC Eyewitness News early in the 1970s on the Willowbrook Institution on Staten Island, New York. Though I was only about 12, that report disturbed me greatly. It had a, um, I, I just, I still, you know, remember um, the impact it had on me. Unfortunately, uh, circumstances were beginning to improve around that time for newborn babies with Down syndrome. It became acceptable for parents to keep their babies to be raised at home. So just when things were looking up for this special population of people, along comes prenatal testing and legal abortion to, again, ruin their lives, or rather, take them. There has never been a better time in the history of the world for a baby with Down syndrome to be born. More understanding and awareness of the genetic condition, more advanced medical technology to treat health issues, more inclusive education, more understanding about their potential, and so much more. But because of legalized abortion, almost three quarters of those prenatally diagnosed don't get the chance in life that is rightfully theirs. I believe that future generations of Americans are going to look back on these decades and wonder how we ever allow this to happen. How, how we, um, just as we look back now and wonder how we could have tolerated slavery, and right here in our own state, how we could have instituted involuntary sterilizations. If this legislature passes this legislation, I believe you will be on the wrong side of history. Rather than, advances, rather than advance this le legislation, I would request that instead you introduce legislation like Indiana's that would support the prenatal discrimination of babies with Down syndrome in the womb. I'd like to end with a quote from Dr. Jerome Lejeune. The quality of a civilization can be measured by the respect it has for its weakest members. There is no other criterion. Thank you very much for your time. And I urge you not to further the um, not to further <laughs> protect the um, the right to abortion. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. For questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, are there questions? Yes. Just um, much of what you said sounds like the time of eugenics in our country, where mm -hmm. different groups of people and all were basically we tried to eradicate them because they were considered genetically inferior. Mm -hmm. And in a way, this is a continuation of that practice from what it sounds like to me. You've made a very compelling Thank you. case. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Eileen, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Eileen. And, and if you are willing, um, as, as Carl said, you made a compelling case, and it would be helpful if we could post it. Hmm. Yes, I, I will send a soft copy to, I have the information where to send that, I think. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank we get good experience of suck, sucking in. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> Some of us don't have to just. <laughs> First of all, let me. <laughs> First of all, uh, let me say that I just heard about this yesterday afternoon, and I wish I had more time to um, provide data and research. I'm going to 
share with you more props on, our, on an emotional basis. Uh, people who know me know that I'm brutally honest, so that's what you're going to hear. Um, and um, uh, hopefully it will pick your consciences, okay? Um, my name is Ken Hopner. I live in Jeffersonville. I'm the father of three children, five grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And at the age of 17, I had my first encounter with sex, which resulted in a pregnancy. We were married in March of 1960, and it was the right thing to do to accept responsibility for my actions. By the time we were 23, we were blessed with a total of three beautiful children. The last one was born in 1967 before Roe versus Wade. Since 1973, there have been more than 58 million abortions performed in the United States. Now, I'd like you to follow a train of thought when you're considering age 57, and let me ask you a few questions. Is it right to commit murder? You will probably answer no. Is it right for a woman to murder her husband? Any of you have multiple wives? Maybe you'd say yes. But on the other hand, is it truly right for a woman to murder her husband? Is it right for a woman to murder her children? And you will definitely answer no. How about a baby in the womb? Now let's consider this. If I change the word baby to fetus, it dehumanizes the infant. If I change the word, or the, the word murder to abortion, it changes the meaning of the procedure. It softens the transaction. And it probably is the grossest rationalization that mankind has ever fostered. Do you believe that 58 million abortions were performed for the sake of planning parenthood? Or is it the motivation to get rid of an unwanted pregnancy? And I believe that government has a responsibility to set a standard of conduct. Is it unreasonable to expect the population should accept responsibility for its actions? Or should we change the laws to accommodate the lack of such a demeanor? As I look around the room, and look at your faces. Consider that someone looked upon you as a baby and not as a fetus. And that's why you're here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there questions? And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Burkett <laughs> came in just in time. Yeah. For a break. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. No, no, I was just here. Got it here. With my notes. So. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Person Hugh Pugh and Vice Chair Haas and Ranking Member McFawn and all members of the committee. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you all about the, in support of the bill, um, H57. Um, my name is Donna Burkett. I'm the Medical Director of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. I'm a family physician and I've been practicing medicine for over 20 years. I've been medical director of PPNE for over five years now, and prior to that, I was the medical director of a southeastern affiliate, Planned Parenthood affiliate, that uh, of four states in the southeast. Um, I know many of you uh, know much about Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, so I'm not going to go into the details of what I've written in my testim in my written testimony in order to give you give us more time for questions. Um, but my goal here is to sort of fill in the holes for you, answer questions um, about abortion care specifically in Vermont, um, as well as in the United States, uh, so that you can confidently pass this bill. So to help you understand some of the subtleties of abortion care as it exists right now in Vermont, I'd like to walk you through what abortion is like for our patients. 
the complexity of the care and the safety of the care. In Vermont, 6% of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England's patients seek abortion care. Uh, out of 19,000 patients, we provide abor abortion care to about 1,100 of them a year. Um, about a third of these are surgical abortions, or as we, do, we like to call them, in-clinic abortions, because that seems a safer and more explanatory term for our patients. And two-thirds are abortion by pill, or medication abortion, as it's also called. The percentage of medication abortions that we do have been increasing for many years now. Uh, likely due to early pregnancy diagnosis or discovery of the pregnancy by the patient um, and, there, and therefore easier, quicker access to care earlier in the pregnancy. Uh, and also because we have um, the, the, the medication by abortion is more available to patients uh, where they live. Um, it's available at more health centers, more days of the week, uh, more hours of the day. Uh, in addition, you should also know that most abortion, whether by pill or in clinic abortion, happens very early in a pregnancy, within six to eight weeks of conception. When a woman finds out she's pregnant unexpectedly, she has to decide whether to continue the pregnancy or end it. Sometimes a woman is very clear very quickly in her decision, and others need more time than that to decide. Women consider the opinions of their partner, their loved ones. They consider fear of the procedure itself, find their financial resources, and their own physical and mental well-being, and much, much more besides. Um, every person is different. Every pregnancy is different. There's a few things that remain consistent, though. For every patient, abortion is a deeply personal medical decision, and it's a decision that they make after careful thought. Once she's decided to end a pregnancy, a woman must consider how to end it. If her decision is made before 10 weeks of, of pregnancy, um, she chooses between abortion by pill and then clinic abortion. In all cases, the pregnancy must be dated in some manner to best understand the safest methods for her. This may be done by understanding a patient's last menstrual period or dates of sexual encounters or by ultrasound. Pregnancy dating is a great example of how legislative restrictions can be problem problematic for patient care. Many states are legislating how ultrasounds must be done before abortions. Meanwhile, there's a, bounting, a mounting body of scientific evidence that ultrasounds are unnecessary prior to some abortions. A good medical history can often suffice, however. As a medical director in North Carolina, I had to develop protocols in response to a law requiring certain consent and ultrasound procedures as one particular example of, of how this can play out. In my experience, though, science, as slow as it can be, usually changes faster than legislation, policy, and procedure. Um, so there are examples like this that abound throughout abor abortion care. If a patient chooses medication abortion, she must make that appointment in a specific time frame. Indeed, this is true of each type of abortion. And this time frame is also one that changes with scientific evidence. An example of that um, is that uh, we keep, with additional evidence, we are able to push up the number of uh, the gestational age for, medic for medication abortion or abortion by pill. Um, so just recently, in the last couple of years, we increased that from nine to 10 weeks along. Um, and there's further evidence that it can be increased to 11 weeks, though that we haven't done that yet. Um, at her visit, a thorough, uh, at a patient's visit, a thorough history is taken and lab tests are done, as well as an ultrasound when needed allowing us to understand whether she has medical conditions that would make the process unsafe for her or for her future pregnant pregnancies. She's thoroughly counseled on the process of abortion by pill and given plenty of opportunities for questions. 
When ready to proceed, our compassionate provider administers, dispenses, or prescribes the set of medications she will need to complete the abortion successfully. She's given a follow-up appointment to assure that everything has gone well and phone numbers to reach our own call staff should, should she have difficulties. Only about 1% of patients have complications that require additional care with this procedure. Usually this care, the additional care occurs in the form of additional medications or sometimes an in-clinic abortion procedure. So if she chooses from the start an in-clinic in abortion, which is also called suction curatage, or you may have heard an older term, DNC, or dilation and curatage, she goes through the exact same medical screening to assure her safety. If she's choosing to be sedated, there's additional screening for this portion of the process. She's counseled just as thoroughly and referred to an outside provider if she falls outside our scope of practice because of her medical conditions. If she's, uh, she is given medications to help her through the procedure in various ways and an antibiotic to prevent infection that could be caused by the procedure. And then an experienced provider completes the suction curatage in a standard manner in a setting appropriate for such care with staff ready to support where needed. The same staff provides sedating medications and monitoring of the patient during recovery, which usually lasts only 15 minutes or so. In fact, the care is so routine and smooth, usually, that many patients comment to us, that was it, that was all. And our safety figures, similar to those across all abortion providers, show complication rates also around 1%. And these complications are usually dealt with uh, by using medication or watchful waiting, rarely an additional suction procedure. If a patient is beyond the first trimester, her options change depending on the gestational age. So medication abortion is no longer an option because of the risk of bleeding outside a hospital setting. At PPNE, we use two procedures very similar to the suction curatage method that are also very safe and have similar rates of complications. If you look at a very large number of patients receiving these procedures, the complication rates go, go up by gestational age, but they never reach that, of the that rate of complications that's uh, inherent to carrying a pregnancy to term. Our safety processes are similar to those in the first trimester, and we are more likely to refer to our hospital-based colleagues for care because there's more often need for closer monitoring during the procedure. So, I'm proud to report to you that the safety of abortion care in Vermont is excellent, and part of that is because of the lack of restrictions. Patients are able to access care early and safely, and that's because of the lack of restrictions. Um, I'd also like to say a word about abortion at gestational, gestational ages that are later than what we offer at PPNE. &E. I am so grateful to be working in a place where these options are available to patients because of the varied reasons a woman may need to access them. Uh, because of serious risks to her health, severe fetal abnormalities, and a host of additional factors that affect the, woman, the decision a woman makes with her provider, usually involving her family, and often involving counselors and religious leaders. These are the kinds of situations where a woman and her doctor need every medical option available. Um, I'd like to share with you a, uh, a couple of cases from my past uh, related to this. Um, I, Vermont is a small state, so I hesitate to share recent examples, so um, I would like to talk about two minors who, um, who received care for me in the setting of, of a family practice. Um, I was not the abortion provider in either case, um, but both were cases that I referred for later gestational care. Um, one was a case uh, of a young uh, Latina girl who was uh, 13, 12 or 13 maybe. Um, I'm not sure that she knew what sex was. She came to me after having presented to 
the emergency room, and I'm sorry, this case still uh, 20 years later literally uh, gets me broken up. Um, she'd presented to the emergency room before because of uh, nausea and vomiting, and she was treated with um, anti-acids. Um, no one thought to check a pregnancy test at that point in her care. Um, many weeks later, that got better. Uh, many weeks later, she came to me uh, with a growing mass in her abdomen. She was brought to the health center where I was working by her father. Um, I uh, asked the father to leave the room, as I do with every adolescent patient that I see. Um, and I felt her abdomen, and I discovered a 20-week gravid uterus. Um, very easily upon exam and was able to get a quick pregnancy test and understand that yes, that wasn't just any, any old mass, that was a mass that you would expect to see at about 20 weeks um, of pregnancy. Um, and so my counseling of her had to start with what sex was. She didn't know. Uh, nor could she even acknowledge to me that she had had sexual intercourse in her life. Um, that's the kind of complex case that gets referred for termination. That's a very young patient with a very immature body at that point in her life who, um, who needed a late-term abortion. I don't think that that's, that was the outcome in the case. Uh, I, I referred it to um, social services, and she ended up uh, not coming back to me for care, so I don't know the outcome. Another case was very similar, but in this case um, was, a, was a young teen who um, was brought to me by a, a mother whose father had impreg impregnated her, and, and she too was very far along in the, in the um, gestational range. Uh, and in that case, I did refer her to a provider in another state who provided these services. So I, I think those are both very illustrative of um, later gestational cases. They are rare, very rare, blessedly so. Um, I appreciate the work that this legislating body has done on adverse childhood events. And I think uh, because of the work you've done on that, um, I think I think you have a, a nice appreciation for um, for the complexity of things that can lead to um, later term abortions, and, and um, that's fully within the realm of what I would expect, with the exception of um, the fetal abnormalities and maternal uh, medical conditions um, that these things fall into. Uh, so since we're just talking about minors, I do want to finally just ask that you keep our legislation free of restrictions on minors' ability to access these services. Um, these two cases, I think, are equally illustrative in the same regard. Um, and the teens to whom I've provided care for for abortion, um, they usually come with an adult. Um, and oftentimes, that, that is apparent. Um, and if they don't, um, they're often with a boyfriend, but they tell me that they have already involved their parents. Uh, in New Hampshire and in, in several states in which I served as medical director in the South, parental notification or consent laws um, left minors in a position of having to go through a judicial bypass process when they knew that abortion was the right choice for them, further delaying their care and the point at which um, they could access these services, thus increasing, although mildly, um, the risk, um, but also the length of the procedure and many other things besides the cost. Um, so in summary, I applaud the introduction of this, of this bill. Um, on behalf of my patients, I hope that you will agree with me that we must keep abortion legal, safe, and free from restrictions. And I'd like to thank um, your leadership, especially uh, the leadership of this committee, um, and Pew in particular, uh, for being the lead sponsor of this bill. And I uh, respectfully ask to, that you ensure that reproductive rights are protected here in Vermont. 
I want to be available to you for questions um, starting now, but even after I leave this room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions from the people around the table? I guess I would ask Topper's question. Okay. Again, is there anything in this? Why do you think this bill is necessary? Because women have the right to abortion at the present time. Without restriction. Without restriction. I think this is necessary because of um, what is going on at our national level and uh, protecting the rights of women in this state are, is, is very important as a statement on the national level and in the event that we were to lose the protection of a row. Thank you. I guess I'd follow up on that. So. Um, Let's say we agree that something's going to happen at the national level, which um, most of the literature on the three judges that are in question say that they won't do, uh, won't overturn Roe. But um, in Vermont, the way it is in Vermont right now, it would still be perfectly legal, 100%. So, and under that context, why would, why do you think we need um, to codify? Um, is there a particular reason beyond it? Because it is already legal and will be, remain legal no matter what the federal government does. So yeah. that's, that was going to be my question. Yeah. I think having legislation that protects it very specifically is important because there, there's less room for ambiguity on the part of women seeking the procedure. Um, I think there is um, clarity on the part of providers. They feel better protected in that situation mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, something just been having been stricken off the books. Um, I think it, it's a, it's a, Better, better space to be in. Um, when surrounding states or other parts of this country, this may well be a criminalized procedure to, uh, to make it crystal clear that it is not here and that it is considered a normal part of medical care in this state um, will go a long way to protecting this safety of care that we have here. Thank you for your answer. Yep. Other, yes, Carl. Well, there are other things that are, you know, criminal at the federal level, which the state still says that they want to make legal, like marijuana, for instance. Okay, it's illegal at the federal level. So, you know, just because the federal government says something doesn't mean that the state sometimes adheres to what the federal government says or does. So, again, I find it very. Uh, troubling that we think we need to do something in case something happens instead of taking a proactive stance at that time with the people that will sit in our chairs at that time. Who knows what the future holds? And, uh, you know, it, it concerns me we're trying to make a decision about something we don't know will even happen. And secondly, that we're making it for future people that, uh, that we don't know who they're going to be. That, are, that should be the ones making that decision if they want to codify in more detail the right women currently have in the state of Vermont. And just like James said, that if, if the uh, Roe versus Wade was, let's say, uh, overturned to the extent that they turned things back to the states, which is most likely what would happen, that they, uh, uh, ex we already have a law in place that says it is legal in the state of Vermont. So I have a hard time really understanding. Well, it's legal by common law. Um, Carl and um, Bryn will, we can ask Bryn these questions. We have an absence of any law, both giving it as a right mm -hmm. or putting limitations on it. So I just want to be, you still, still hold your okay. Matthew James. All right. So I think I, you know, I'd love to address that question, if, if I may, from the point of view of a physician. Um, and I'll use the marijuana example as a segue into it. Um, 
I, for one, struggle with medical marijuana as, uh, you know, as a set of laws in the state because um, I feel that there's not a whole lot of uh, medical evidence for marijuana, and I don't want to get into all of that, but like I worry about my own license in this setting where there's, it's illegal at the federal level, and, and therefore I'm cautious about that as a provider. Fortunately, I'm not in a situation as medical director of Planned Parenthood where I need to be, where I'm asked to prescribe marijuana. But if I were, that's a, a road I would walk down extremely cautiously. And so um, I think that, you know, if you think about a potential future state where you've got a, a federal criminality or even next door neighboring state criminality, jump three states over, physicians are very cautious people. And, um, and, and the, the route to their livelihood is through their license. And the thought that they could lose their license by providing a certain type of care um, is very threatening. And so I think for that reason alone, it's, it's worthwhile. Um, so that's, that's my two cents about that. I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. I can't resist if I tried to clarify something for Carl. Um, around medical marijuana, mm -hmm. Vermont law does not have you prescribing it. Oh, that's it has true. you it's a attesting to a condition. Thank you. Thank you. I, it, it may be a, for you, it may mean the same thing. Yes. But we have been very clear in trying to walk that line and, res and respecting the fact yes. that it is not a prescription, but rather um, an affirmation that, yes, person X, you have these conditions. That's all. And, 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 I, and, and I don't mean, I just wanted. I think doctors fall all over the map with regard to this in terms of. Yeah, their no, I do too. Level. I just yeah. wanted to, so, I, if I was correcting yeah. Carl, I wanted um, to correct a lot. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm tougher than Carl. Thanks for coming in, John. Could you um, um, describe for me the kind of counseling um, an individual gets at Planned Parenthood when they present as being pregnant? Yes. Um, well, was it somebody presents as being pregnant. Um, and not specifically for abortion services. Um, we provide a service that we call options counseling, um, where we talk to patients about their options to continue or not to continue the pregnancy, and then if they choose to continue the pregnancy, the option to parent or not to parent. And so our staff are trained in doing that in a very compassionate, non-judgmental way, in a non-guiding way. Um, the pay, the, it needs to be the patient's decision um, and, and not related to the staff bias on the matter, right? So um, uh, that's what they receive. Um, if they come to us having already decided to obtain an, uh, an abortion, sometimes they might have gone through that counseling with us, um, but if they schedule, um, they, they receive a briefer bit of counseling about that just to assure that they have considered those options. But remember that they're in a different discussion mm -hmm. on um, how many people come in with that presentation, how many people choose to continue the pregnancy, and how many people Oh, that's a good question. Um, you no, know, you know, our, our data is not great enough to uh, fully capture that. Um, you know, I know that we do more options counseling preg and pregnancy tests together as a whole than we do abortions. Um, and, you know, surely there's people doing uh, pregnancy tests at home alone and, and then going through their process and then scheduling with us, and this is the first time we've seen them for an abortion. Uh, we, we wouldn't necessarily have seen them prior to that for a pregnancy test. So the data is a little confusing. They might go to some, they might go somewhere else for their, um, 
for an abortion. They might go somewhere else for pregnancy testing, either one. So how does this move? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you want to ask um, how, how does this fit then with your statement earlier that 6% of all your services are abortions? Yeah, so we see patients for many services. Um, we see them for contraception. Uh, we see them for well person visits. We see uh, folks for STI testing. Um, Pregnancy tests is, is one of the services that we do, um, and much, much more besides. So that list um, that's there in your, um, in your notes is the list of services that we provide, and abortion services are a very small uh, percentage of that. Does that answer the question? Um, it does, but you know, there's a concern that maybe if you talk about abortion being an option, that that will be the choice, as opposed to if you do not present it as an option. That's not our experience. We present it as an option all the time, and, and many people choose to continue their pregnancy. Um, everybody's different, and every pregnancy is different. And certainly more women choose to, to continue their pregnancy than to abort it. In the questions you may ask about uh, in counseling, uh, is one of them, why do you want to terminate, or you know, if they want an abortion, why they want to terminate? Or is that not a question? We, um, we allow time for the patient to talk, but mm -hmm. we do not pressure her as to why. Okay. And oftentimes the reasons come out in that setting. Mm -hmm. There's a follow-up to what Eileen, Eileen, uh, Elaine, sorry, okay, no, Eileen. Was, was, hmm? Eileen. was talking about is the the fact that uh, there could be, you know, what people would worry about, would there be some leading questions to, uh, you know, this baby may be Down syndrome uh, affected, if you will, and for that reason, would you want to terminate the pregnancy? Uh, versus, uh, how should I say it, would, would you encourage somebody to have an abortion for those reasons? No. In your counseling? No, okay. absolutely not. So what about if the woman says uh, it's, a, it's a black baby, I don't want a black baby? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, how about sex? You know, that's not the right sex, so... Absolutely not. Okay. You wouldn't counsel them about it, but you wouldn't advise them that's not a good reason for terminating a pregnancy? No, we don't, you know, we don't have those kinds of reasons come up in a, in a manner that... Because it's an absolute right, is that correct? You know, it's an absolute right in the state now. In other words, you couldn't, even if you objected to the reason they wanted to, uh, you, you couldn't object to it. Right. Regardless of the reason, we honor a patient's right. That's right what I'm saying. Issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some states. If a that patient would ask, is ambivalent sir. about yeah. it, if she seems on the on the fence, um, oftentimes we refer her for counseling, and that's a setting in which mm -hmm. you know somebody can get into more of those um, mm -hmm. ethical nuances, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that may you know be based on the patient's values mm -hmm. um, that you know. <laughs> and and that's a setting where, where that might come up. But in our setting, we honor the patient's decision. And it's a, a follow-up, because I've asked this before, but um, somebody that knows as much as you do about this situation, if there was ever a time where a compromise was proposed, that abortion, a right for a woman to have an abortion uh, would protect that right up through uh, age of viability, like 22, 24 weeks. And beyond that, it would have to be a medical necessity to terminate a, a pregnancy, in other words, an abortion. Would, would you even consider something like that? Can you, can you restate it? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, as I say, this issue on abortion, it's, it's been with us for 
50, 60 years. Okay, it probably, maybe it's going to be with us another 50 or 60. I would say it's okay, with us all right. since so I'm just saying that sometimes <laughs> you say, I mean, the spirit of legislation is compromise. Okay, mm -hmm. And to come to some reasonable compromise, it wouldn't satisfy the absolute right to life first, obviously. And uh, the other would not uh, satisfy people that believe they should have an absolute right through the whole pregnancy. I'm just saying, is there any room to say, is a compromise possible, in your opinion? Meaning, abortion would be absolute right up through age of viability, whatever that is. That, you know, right now we're 20, 22 to 24 weeks, approximately. And beyond that, it would not be an absolute right but based on medical necessity for the for the health of the woman. So I'll leave the compromising positions to the purview of the legislators. Mm -hmm. What I would like to say is just to reiterate my position on um, my gratefulness that we have the ability to refer patients for those very rare cases. Mm -hmm that come up at later gestations. Mm -hmm. And these are not cases that one takes lightly, mm -hmm. no matter when one runs into them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't think that there is a provider out there providing you know, care at these gestational ages that is not mm -hmm. compassionate, mm -hmm. patient-centered, high moral value care. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want the committee to know as you contemplate your decision. That's what, I'm sorry? That's what I'd like the committee to know as you contemplate your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for the doctor? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Questions um, and again to and we all we can, we continue to have questions about what is the legal context and is um, is abortion a right in Vermont and all sorts of things like that. So um, <laughs> take it away, Bryn. Okay, nice to see you again, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, so I am prepared to answer some of the questions that came up in testimony yesterday from Mr. Page. Um, I believe that he submitted a document to you with five questions that he presented to the committee. So I'll just go through those um, and tell you what my opinion is about those questions. So the first was, would legislative, judicial, or administrative action requiring parental notification be prohibited if Act, or if H-57 uh, were to pass? And um, I just want to remind the committee that what the bill does is it um, prohibits public entities, that definition of public entities, from depriving a consenting individual of her choice to carry out or terminate her pregnancy, and it also prohibits public entities from interfering with or restricting the choice of a consenting individual to terminate or carry out a pregnancy. Yes. <laughs> so, the, as you may as you may know, the General Assembly um, is granted the supreme legislative authority uh, under the Vermont Constitution, Chapter Two, Section Two, <clears throat> and that. Power includes um, preparing bills um, and enacting them into laws. So there's nothing to prevent a future legislature from notwithstanding the provisions in H-57 and requiring parental notification. Or to nothing prevents a legislator from asking for a bill that would re require parental notification. The real nature of legislative action is that subsequent governments are free to revisit the policy decisions that they make. So um, 
Carl. E even though we are a public institution, that's the legis That's what I wanted to clarify. In other words, it said any public institution, and I thought we, as the legislature, were considered a public institution. You are, but we're above and beyond. But you the have constitutional authority. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, in the event that a judge would require parental notification, um, I think that we would likely have a bigger problem on our hands that mm -hmm. judges were not enforcing the law. Um, so that is unlikely to occur. Judges typically interpret the law and enforce the law as it is written. Um, if some administrative action were taken that would require um, parental notification, then the injured party in that scenario would have a private right of action um, under the bill as written. Could I just follow up on that? Okay. Um, what about, and I just following up on something James alluded to, but let's say the child is a, a ward of the state at this point or, you know, comes under chins or, or what's the proper term? DCF has to be, I guess, right? Uh, so the child would make their the decision themselves and the <coughs> social worker would not be the one that would counsel this individual. Well, um, there's no laws for, currently in Vermont that require parental notification for a minor to get an abortion. Right. But as you know, and as you've probably heard, um, parents have legal authority over their health care decisions of their children, and individual practitioners might have different policies about sharing information. Mm -hmm. So um, if a child was in the custody of DCF, um, it is likely that they would share with their with, um, biological parents. I, well, I don't know if that would happen or not. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. That seems like a big gray area. Could I just, again, a follow up? Absolutely. All right. Sometime this morning, we, we came up and I had written down Bryn uh, for a question about the age of 12 or above is a protected status or uh, for not notifying or not consulting a parent. In other words, a child became pregnant at 11 years of age, would, would the parent make the decision on whether they had uh, an abortion or not? Well, again, there we don't have the, there is no um, requirement by statute that mm -hmm. um, anyone other than the person seeking an abortion have authority over that decision. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have a cutoff. I'm wondering then why I wrote this down, age of 12 or above. Well, somebody Do somebody have, mentioned it. Do we have anything um, mm -hmm. in statute or she did, that's what I thought, but what, what did she say? Yes, I believe we do. She said that. I do believe that that age, I, I would like to check on okay. that age before I Thank tell you what it is. Okay. okay, so it might be an age of consent is what it amounts to. Consent to medical treatment. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was just curious about. Is yes. under 12, it means that uh, they would not be able to make a kind of consent on their own or whatever. I will, I will look into that. The, the doc, just to clarify, the doctor made the point of 12 years old for reproductive, like reproductive health decisions. <coughs> so, but anyway, Bryn can <coughs> okay. James. A pretty big question, possibly, but um, is there any other medical procedure that a 12 year old can get without parental? I don't know the answer to that. But again, I'll look into the age of consent to medical treatment. You know, just <laughs> just prompted another one. If uh, if a child at that point wanted a sex change operation, uh, would they need parental consent on something like that? You know, I I am not sure. Okay. So something else to look into. I will, let, I will look into the age of consent to medical treatment. I imagine that individual providers have different policies about um, sharing information with children's parents because um, children are often covered under their parents' health insurance, and mm -hmm. so sometimes that information is required to be shared. Thank you. So what is the difference between an individual provider and a public entity? Um, the, the, the law says a public entity. Right, so individual providers are not uh, public entities. Public entities, as, as described in um, the definition section of the bill, really applies to governmental entities, um, any subdivision of state government or local municipal government counts as a public entity. 
no provider um, would be covered under that. And that goes to answer another one of Mr. Page's questions. I think it was question three, would health care providers have an affirmative duty to participate in abortions? And the answer to that is no. Nothing in the bill imposes any duty on a provider um, to participate in an abortion. So I'm just trying to get my mind around this. You're saying that uh, even if the law says what it, the way I understand it, what it, what it does, that if it's a private provider, they might seek the parental advice of the, the child and not perform an abortion until they receive it. Is that true, or would they be? Violating the law if they did that. No, they would not be. They wouldn't. No. Okay. All right. If they, if we. Were. Okay. No. Again, just because it's the law's scope is restricted to those public entities, any public mm -hmm. entity that attempts to mm -hmm. restrict the right. Top. <clears throat> Brent, I, I, I believe I heard you say that. Um, future legislators could, in fact, change this whole thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I thought you said. And, and I've read the, this section several times, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out um, how that statement can stand. Um, I look at the definition of public ent uh, entity, and it says the legislature. And it says under abortion and restricting access prohibited. And it says a public entity, the legislature, shall not. And then it goes into all of those things. So I'm trying to I'm trying to understand if it says we can't do it, how can we say we can do it? Well, you have a constitution. You know, future legis legislators. Mm -hmm. So under the Vermont Constitution, do you have the supreme legislative authority um, to create laws, to draft bills and, and pass laws? So you're at that constitutional right. Um, so then should we take this, why don't we take this out then? It shouldn't be in there, right? That is, that's up to you. Let's take that out. Uh, to me, to me, um, Even though I have a constitutional right to do something, there's a law here that I think it's going to cause problems. There's something written into the law that says I can't do it in the future. Copper, what's this law passes? What section is that under? It's page four. Page four? Right at the top. Am I right? Page four. Well, tell me. Are you right about what? When, when we define public entity and we name the legislature, and then we sort of talk about abortion, restricting access, okay. it's, it, it says a public entity, the legislature, shall not. And then it lists all the things that we shall not do mm -hmm. in the law. So what I'm trying to, uh, even though I have a constitutional right to make laws, mm -hmm. here's a law that's telling me that I can't fool around with this anymore. That's what it says to me, and that's what I'm trying to. Understood, yes. So the, this legislation is modeled off of, or this bill is modeled off of Oregon legislation, um, a bill that Oregon passed in 2017, in which they provide that, um, they, they provide for a very similar definition of what a public entity is. And so that was that is sort of the foundation for where this language came from. Again, um, nothing the legislature does can bind the actions of a future legislature. Um, so, I but I leave it to the committee to decide what you how you would like to how you would like to amend the law. It's really the same question, I guess. But I mean, on line eighteen on page under under definitions, it specifically says public entity means the legislature. It was legislative. So, executive right, so or any elective um, or even though system. technically, as you say, legally, the, the legislature can't hold future legislatures uh, to their bill, this language specifically says it can't. It can. You, know, this is, you can't touch it again. That's what it says. Even if the law says differently, 
but that's what this bill says. Um, and my concern is if you leave that language in there, um, isn't even it, well. There's going to be lawyers that always argue something. Um, they'll say, well, it says right here, legislative, and you'll have legislative leaders in the future who will say, well, we really can't take that up, even though the, the Constitution says we can. We really can't take it up because it says right there, the first two words of legislator, legislature. Um, I have real concerns about that word legislature being in there in, con um, in conflict with the fact that you're saying the Constitution allows us to, do, to override it. It, it kind of sends really significant mixed messages. Understood. And it also talks about elected officials within their elective or appointed officer. In any of those branches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this bill, whether it meant to or not, seems to try to supersede the fact that the Constitution says we. Um, I, I don't think the bill is trying to supersede the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I will say that the legislators and the legislature mm -hmm. does more than just pass bills. Mm -hmm. There are other opportunities for le members of the legislature to um, interfere with or restrict in the regulation or provision of benefits, facilities, services, or information, the choice of an individual to terminate a pregnancy. I don't, I think that you're, um, there may be <clears throat> other situations besides the passage of legislation. Okay, we have a lineup. Two, three, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I, I mean, my read of it, I, I get where you guys are coming from, sort of. I, I get where, how you read that into that. But at any time, you just also, and it's basically a premise that too, but you, um, you know, it's not like we would pass a law to, that would change this law. We would just erase this part of the act. Yeah, you know, like uh, like any law that we would write, if you wanted to change this down the road, would remove this language, and that's kind of how how legislation works, like how it's formed. This is this changes part of the title, and this all this language gets added to the existing act, and so in the future, if you want to change it, well, your changes would be to omit this back from the act. And so it's not that you necessarily write a law that then goes against this law. You're just writing a law that erases this law. So it's just kind of, I mean, that's sort of how it works, like functionally. Just something to keep in mind. I'm, I'm sure there's other people in the queue, right? Yes, they're, they're, they're um, do you want, you're, you're, you're five. No, I'm, I'm, you're, you're five, no, Topper, Topper's after, but first, um, Teresa, I uh, I think Logan essentially said what I just was like. So, so in my, my Wait, I, I oh, I thought was it was my turn. No, right. I think there was, was there someone? Mm -hmm. there? It was me. I think you were oh, oh, oh. What? Okay. I think that um, I've already, it's been said. Mm -hmm. Top. So uh, the, the way I read it is it would not allow although constitutionally we're supposed to have that right, it wouldn't even allow us to, do, to change the law. That's what it says. That's how I feel the way it's written. Because it says the legislature is prohibited from. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it says an, a, an appointed officer or an employee even within those branches is prohibited from. So I, I, I just think it restricts the legislature. Well, we don't have any appointed officers or employees. Well, elected. We're not either officers or employees. Yeah, I know that. I'm just saying it, it goes that far. To me, it says nobody can change this thing, which is fine. But I feel that it's going overboard. I think this whole thing is going to draw our attention, so much attention, um, that whatever was intended is not going to happen. So what if that part wasn't in there? What, what's it do to the, to the law? The, the part? The legislative part. Yeah. Yeah, just the legislative part. Because, I mean, you've been doing this for a while. I mean, how many bills do you see that says the legislature can't can't do anything about it in the future. 
Well, she's saying that, that they, they can. I know they right. can, right. but this specific but the language can. seems to differ. I, mean, yeah. I think James's question is, is similar language in Vermont. other things that we um, have passed? You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I can certainly ask my colleagues. It seems like there is a definition, the definition of public entity is because public entity is in other legislation. At least I remember from last year, there are a lot of bills that refer to a public entity and then in the definitions, legislature is included in that. And yet the legislature can still override Yes. the bill in another session, that no one session of the legislature can have it, um, can force another uh, legislature to either do or not do yes. something different. That's correct. And it's, that's a given, like, mm -hmm. we just, it's just known. I can't even imagine someone feeling handcuffed by by any statement in legislation that we pass that a brand new elected group would come in and not be able to change it. I mean, we have, our egos are way too big for that. I, I, I don't think it's a matter of ego. I think that um, when, when. Standing is one of our favorite words. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fancy verb. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tucker, were you about to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, why don't, why don't we just, why don't you just leave it? Chapter 223, Reproductive Rights, Freedom of Choice, and just leave it there. What do we need all this other stuff for? <laughs> Is that a question for me? You don't have to answer that question. I'm not sure that's a question for our nonpartisan well, legislative. I think that we, is a nonpartisan. That's, that's a nonpartisan question. <laughs> why, why do we need it? I was asked to draft this bill. That's why I drafted it. I was asked to draft it. Is there is there a right to abortion in Vermont right now? Is there a right to abortion? Yes. Um, as we discussed yesterday under um, federal Supreme Court jurisprudence, there is a right to abortion in Vermont. But it comes from the federal government. There is no right in our own constitution. Is that right? Um, common law right? I, don't I, mean, I, thought, I, I thought you said there was in our, you know, that we've made no, certain. No. Uh, I think what I said was that the, the, uh, the question hasn't been presented yet, whether our own Vermont Constitution, they haven't examined our, um, whether or not that independent right exists under our Constitution. Okay. But yesterday you said it was uh, rooted in common law, right? Mm. That was when right. I was talking about personhood. Okay. It's a common law. Personhood, you have to be born to be a person. And I'm, I'm going to read this, and, and then I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Um, it says, the legislative intent is to safeguard this act, is to safeguard the right to an abortion in Vermont by ensuring, that, by ensuring that right is not denied, restricted, or infringed on by a governmental entity. Why is that in there? Why, why do we have to add? Why don't we just... It's not restricted or infringed upon. It seems to be dealing with a public entity. It brings it in when it doesn't need to be there. If you have the right, you have the right. We are, a woman already has the right in Vermont as we sit here. We're bringing in something and saying, you don't have the right public entity. Well, we don't need to. It's, it's already there. I think that um, the title of the act might go towards answering your question, preserving the right, um, ensuring that the right is not uh, chipped away at, perhaps, is one way to look at it. The right does exist, um, but it essentially the bill is preventing that right from being, um, from being narrowed in scope. So is it an act relating to preserving the right to abortion? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's already there. That, that's my big problem here. Yeah. We have that. In Vermont, we have that right right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then if we said the next part 
all you need is one paragraph, an individual, an individual's protective rights, and then it lays it out. All this other stuff, I think, confuses the whole thing. But that's my opinion. <clears throat> Chapter, I encourage you when we talk, when we do markup, as you know, the process of markup is to look at the language and is to suggest um, amendments. And and so, if, okay. if, if you know, suggest an amendment. I, I will. I, I'm just. I was trying to get legally. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is there a need for the bill? No. Well, yeah, that's one question. But the other question, <laughs> you're asking him. <laughs> I mean, I really have that question. But the other part is all this other stuff that's in here about a public entity. Is that necessary? I mean, I feel like you're asking me a question that I can't answer. Uh -huh. I, I, I am, I am not here to answer whether or not you, I'm, policy questions. I can't answer those questions for you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm talking You can only answer legal, legal questions. Right? I'm asking legally, do we need this, all this other stuff about a public entity? Do we need that It depends on what, what you would like to achieve. I want, okay. It's, it's our decision, she's saying. It's, it, this is not, this is not, 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 it's not a question that she has the ability to answer given her role. It's the same thing as when during the budget hearings and we have someone sit in that thing and we go, you can't really believe that you know cutting the funding for this is okay. Yes, they right. can't answer that. They're the governors and okay. people. Right. You know, but I mean it's I mean, so that'd be a question. Let me ask it a different way altogether. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the, I'll you, be right back. I am an individual that wants to ensure the individual reproductive rights of women are safe. And uh, I make the statement that every individual has the fundamental right, et cetera, all of these, these three or four things that are written. Do I need to say anything else legally? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Do you need to say anything else as a person? As no, no, no. Bill as a legislator, I'm putting in legislation. Do I need to add public entities? It don't depends have any on what right your purpose. To, what, what is the what is the purpose of what you would like to achieve? Um, that individual productive rights are protected, as they are now. That's all I want to do. I think that that's one way to achieve it, and another way to achieve it is to ensure that a public entity can't infringe upon that right. That, that, that's one. Why? Why do we put it in? What are we worried about? Again, we're saying, we're, again, we have a law saying you got you you, you have that right. I and then we see the, what about in, besides public entities? How about a is, is the court in here? Yes. Mm -hmm. I can assure you. Like, so we're saying okay. I guess. Can I just say it hypothetically? I could imagine, let's say the health department for some reason, 10 years from now, comes up and statistically the uh, people that had abortions had two times the, uh, let's say, or half the life expectancy of other people. They might suggest that we uh, get rid of that right, okay? Because it's, uh, as far as they're concerned, it's taking more lives of women than uh, than previously. So and I guess that was just a hypothetical. But I just thought that would be a public entity, meaning the health department, coming up and saying they want to limit people's right to abortion to just you say, do that. what's that? Well, that's what you can't do that. I know. Well, that's I, what mean, I'm I, think, I think that's what this is trying to do, not necessarily the legislature. I mean, uh, based on what Bryn's told me, I. I you know, I, I believe her, the legislature is not included in 
in that prohibition, but other agencies of the state government would be without legislative action, it would seem. Like. Is that the way? That, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was, was going to do yeah. a different example, but I was trying to come up with an example that would help us to see why it's in there. And we do have well, quite an entity and a lot of bills. So we'll, we'll come back to that so you know. I mean, and, and this is clearly one of those, I mean, this is on some level a, a committee discussion. I mean, Topper, you're asking Bren why, and Bren drafted a bill because I asked him to. So on some level, the question is, I mean, and so when we have committee discussion around this, you know, and we heard testimony today um, from a doctor who said um, um, there's less room for ambiguity, clarity on the part of providers, and so that providers would feel better protected. That may not be a good enough reason for you. To protect them now. That may, I'm saying that may not be a good enough reason for you, but there's, I mean, so these are opinion things for us to figure right. out. And one other thing that I should add to that is that if there's a right asserted in statute, it's very different than a right being found to exist in the Constitution. So part of what this bill does is it prohibits public entities from doing certain things, and that provides a recourse for a person who, um, who's injured if, the, if a public entity, public entity does do one of those things. So if it, there's simply a right asserted um, in the statute, it doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean that um, some administrative body of the government wouldn't attempt to restrict that right. And if that were to happen, that person wouldn't have recourse if there were just a statement of what uh, existing existing legislation is. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Bernie. That's why I'm saying when we put the word legislature in there, legislation, Right, I, I understand, I understand that. Exactly the concern that you have about that word. Um, I, do, I was gonna respond to some of Mr. Page's other questions. Yes. Like. Okay. So, um, one of his questions was, would H57 immunize practitioners of partial birth abortion from any civil or criminal penalties? And the short answer to that is no. Um, and that's because um, of a doctrine called preemption. Um, it, this law would be preempted by the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act. Um, and preemption applies when state law and federal law may conflict on some level. Um, part of the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution um, provides the doctrine of preemption, which says the federal government is going to win in a case of um, some discrepancy between federal and state law. And committee, we will have some testimony next week um, because it is my understanding that there's no such thing as a partial birth abortion. That, that is a framing of something that in fact does not exist. Um, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to, but I'm, we're going to get testimony and I'm sure because we've already had testimony sort of around that. But that but I played a doctor on TV. Oh, no. Oh, please. I play all sorts of things. <laughs> no, remember. No, uh, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and then one of his other questions was uh, related to what I believe he was referring to was a um, crisis pregnancy center um, and whether or not um, H57 would inhibit the operation of a crisis pregnancy center. Um, and the answer is no. It's not a public entity. It's a private entity. Um, and in fact, Vermont doesn't impose any regulations um, on crisis pregnancy centers at all. Um, and I can talk about what those are if anybody doesn't know. Well, I, I'd be in there as well. I was just going to ask that. Uh, what's a crisis Go pregnancy ahead. center? So those are um, organizations that are established uh, to counsel pregnant women against having an abortion. And typically, they're mission-driven organizations based on religious ideology um, and not on the care of the person who's presenting for treatment or some, some states have considered and may have already um, legislation, which is not in this in the bill that I introduced, no. <laughs> um, um, to um, 
around what they can call themselves. Mm -hmm. um, if I am a woman new to town, I'm new to Vermont, and I find myself pregnant, and I'm not sure what to do, and there is an organization that calls themselves a crisis pregnancy center. I may think I am going somewhere to learn and hear and talk to someone about all of the options, all of the possibilities, all of the different ways I could respond to being pregnant by virtue of its name, mm -hmm. a crisis pregnancy. I mean, mm -hmm. and um, so there are there are entities across the country that have put restrictions on either the name or what they have to do. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if you'd like, I could add that to this, um, <laughs> but I have not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I thought we, we could just handle one thing. So is Bryn going to put these answers up on um, so I understand that this committee likes to have written testimony to make public from the witnesses. I have not done that with my own notes, um, okay. but okay. I would be glad to do that if you, it would be helpful to the committee. It might just take a little bit of time. I think um, it would be, because he was very specific, these five questions, and it would be nice sure. to have them if we could. Thank you, because um, sometimes we need to hear it more than once. Mm -hmm. and what I heard your answers were, no, it would not prohibit crisis pregnancy. Um, no, it does not impose any obligation on the provider. Um, no, it would not provide um, any obligation. No, it would not prohibit a future legislature um, for enacting different laws around um, abortion. and. No, it would not um, immune a provider for for any civil or criminal liability. Mm -hmm. And his last for any his, reason was his last question about the viability of a fetus or something like that. I didn't see any question. I think maybe there were some no rights. there were some concerns he expressed later in the in his I testimony that I didn't again. I didn't respond to because I thought yeah. those were so policy questions. Yeah, so. Um, the fifth one is if the answer is yes to any of these, should you create some some additional provisions to um, bring, bring when you um, when you were giving us this sort of the, the, the legal context of before um, there is that there's a section in the bill around um, um, around a fetus not having separate rights and you were you you, count, you, you explained that in terms mm -hmm. of that that's not different than, than what is now but could you say that mm -hmm. again yes so um, there is Vermont Supreme Court jurisprudence that confirms that Vermont is a uh, abides by the, the born alive rule which is um, the prevailing United States common law rule that you must be born before you have personhood. Um, and, per, and once you are born, you are a person, and you have personhood, and the, and the statutes apply to you. And I'd be glad to put a, and to include that as a part of my uh, responses that I give you in writing. That would be great. I think that's also what he's getting at in number five, mm -hmm. in the last part of too. the question on number five. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have it. Are there other, any questions right now for Brent? Tucker. No? Oh, well, I'm <laughs> you, you raised your hand. Well, no, I'm going to. He's holding his head up. Brent, comments. Brent, thank you. Yes. Mm, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. So, appreciate it. Comment. Go away. Um, Come away. Whatever it is. I, I, I just want to make sure I heard the right thing. I think you said there's no such a thing as a straight term of Partial birth. Partial birth. Is that what you said? And I know. It seems to me that, I don't know whether my memory, but I thought I saw it on television um, that very thing. And well, um, I will 
more than happily pass this on to a doctor next week to mm -hmm. respond. And given the fact, given who is in the um, room, I am sure we will have multiple um, disagreements. But mm -hmm. um, on that, just a matter of time. I know that they. I know that the Planned Parenthood, when they do it, it's not long alive, right? Because you give the shot, and that was explained yesterday or mm -hmm. today. But I, I have seen with my own eyes those kinds of abortions on television when they were doing documentaries. Well, I think it's when now, actual not from body, body parts are. Or any other place. Yeah. I'm just saying. And I thought there was a doctor that was prosecuted for that. Yeah. I think they mean, it, or, or at least the term was used that it was partial birth abortion when body parts are removed uh, surgically and taken out through the vagina, okay, uh, as part of the procedure. That's, that's what I think, why they call it a partial birth abortion, because body parts are extracted. But I, I may be wrong, but I mean, that's just my recollection of the same thing you're talking about, Doc. So we'll get some clarity mm -hmm. onto that. <clears throat> Um, this is going to be, I mean, I want to you know, sort of reiterate what, um, for, especially for the new folks, what the process is. We're going to, we're going to talk, you know, you know, um, for as much as people want to talk or if people don't want to talk. And um, if people want to, if members want to um, make amendments, we ask Bryn to write them up and we vote them and we discuss them. And we um, make a decision as a committee.